light and flame. Right fire. Red is the color of desire. Light the flame. Bright the fire. Red is the color of desire. Light the flame. Bright the fire. Red is the color of desire. <laughs> a great deal of the witchcraft that the public is involved with and that they see is really just a um, form of perversion, sexual perversion on the part of the participants. I don't think it has anything to do with witchcraft. Where is the true witchcraft? I think the true witchcraft stems back into uh, the dark ages when uh, man was very much involved in trying to um, assert himself in his environment 
and uh, the witches of the past were involved in helping people with uh, medicinal uh, activities, herbs and so on. I think that's what true witchcraft is. You described yourself as a rational witch. Well, uh, as rational, I think, as any creative individual can hope to be. I don't consider myself uh, completely normal. I realize I'm abnormal, but I think of myself as intelligent, and I don't have um, an attitude of wishing to um, invade other people's privacy with wild predictions, as some of the psychics do. I'm not too terribly interested in that. Unfortunately, if you're in the public eye and you don't make predictions, you're considered a phony. You can be psychic as hell all of the time, but if you don't make a prediction about an earthquake or who's going to be the next president, you're not, um, you're not running out front. <laughs> You've written several books which have been very successful, and now you have a record album out about uh, seduction through witchcraft. Yeah. This mm -hmm. seems to be very profitable. Field. Oh, it's very profitable for me, but then I think I probably would have had um, a good vocation if I was a witch or not a witch, you know, it doesn't really matter, does it? If you write, you write. Being a witch is a personal thing for me, it's the way I live my own private life. It's the way I attack my problems, my situations, my involvements. Can you give us an example of that, how it would differ from, say, a normal person or some well, non-witch. Okay, I think like a normal woman, if she was after someone and was uh, wanting to interest him, would go about in all of the very normal ways of uh, dressing attractively, making up properly, uh, trying to please him. A witch, being abnormal, will um, get hold of a red candle and um, gaze into the flame and attempt to attract him, sometimes at distances of 8, 10, 12, 15,000 miles, um, by projecting herself, her psychic self, into his environment and drawing him back to her. The trick is to trigger the subconscious, and I learned to trigger it with the flame of a candle. Abnormal, but it works for me. Hand me a candle. <laughs> <laughs> Can you remember being born, Bob? You're being born. Can you remember it? You can't remember anything about being born. We're taking you back into your mother's womb. Can you remember anything in your mother's womb? Bob, remember anything? Speak if you can. I'm going to take you back beyond the barrier of birth. If you can r see anything, let me know. As, you, as we count the centuries back, you will, if there's some consciousness, you will know it. If there isn't, you will say it's dark. Do you understand? One, two, three, four, five, six. I'm talking to your subconscious mind. Seven, eight, nine, ten. Freeze! Now, who can open their hands and who can't? If you can't, don't be alarmed. If they're frozen, don't be alarmed. Hi. Uh. Who's frozen? Okay. Okay. Open up. Open up. Open up. You're right. Okay. Now, we have shown one thing what can be done with a psychosomatic. Okay. I'm going to lay these out in a very simple pattern. The first card will be a card that covers you. So right over you, the high priestess, is the card of the magician, or, or Hermes. And beneath you is the queen of pentacles, and above you is the page of cups. Now, in a tradition of divination, um, the magician would explain to you what powers or energies are available to you. So r really, as a practical means of psychotherapy, is the way that the, the gypsy fortune teller, once a year, he'd come into town and straighten out everybody's head for them, you see. That's, that's why they dug him. Uh, these are very complex patterns. They're very simple patterns. This is a simple one. You put one card on the past, and, and that card, like, would be a four of pentacles. It would be anchored down in materiality, the pentacles being the suit that, that, that's concerned with earth. So your fortune, like, would depend upon this very firm but, but very... Uh, solid and low-level earthly uh, structure. And then your fortune would be read in terms of this possibilities that are open for you out of the chance of all these cards. Why should just those cards come up, you see? Uh, nobody could tell you what they meant. It'd be like, these are the powers that are available to you, and if you want to use them, you use them. If there are dangers, then you're aware of them, so you avoid them. So in a sense, you're saying that the individual has a ability to control their destiny rather than just acting as if this is a 
a mirror of the future? That's certainly the theory of, of the tradition of the Taro, yeah, is that it's, uh, that it's wide open, that it's simply a message from chance, and you read it and you do with it with whatever you want. You can go to the future, which would be to the other side of this, with a bridge card. The bridge card that came up for you is uh, the Day of Judgment. <laughs> but what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> this is the apocalypse. It's all over. <laughs> but it's ready to start again because it's all cyclical and it has to do with death and rebirth. In, in terms of uh, your life, I don't know what this would mean, but this would be some event that would cross your path and it would be a bridge to the future. Uh, actually, uh, there are many different readings traditionally throughout Western art history for each one of these cards. This card also becomes a card for the Enlightenment. So it may be that you're on your path to, to being enlightened. Let's hope so. That Enlightenment would lead to this future. And th that's a card, the Eight of Wands, or the Eight of Clubs, would be the, the bridge suit. And that just means change, it means total change. Everything's swirling around you. And uh, so after enlightenment, maybe the world looks like that for a while. This is called a test for clairvoyance, actually, because you're not getting the information from anything but your intuition about which card belongs where. And as soon as you've done that, we'll turn them over and see exactly how well you've Am done. Am I supposed to be thinking? No, about actually, this? you're not supposed to be thinking because we think ESP is an unconscious process. Well, you got the first one, right? You got two, okay? Now we'll take it here and see how you've done there. And you only got one there, but you're still doing pretty well. What's the difference between this, say, and women's intuition? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> women's intuition may be a form of ESP, and on the other hand, it may not. So far, you've gotten five correct. If you got any, there, you're slightly above chance. There are people who have been known to do this and get all 25 correct. And when, we think when that happens, then they can do it with some degree of regularity, that this is a very good demonstration of ESP. They've developed a new type of photography called high-frequency electrical field photography. Very complicated. Word. But what it does do, when it takes a photograph of, for example, here's a Kopec coin, you get what they call a bioplasma body emerging around it, which, in old-fashioned old terms, we call an aura surrounding a body mm -hmm. or a person, which they also get when they photograph a leaf. And I'm told that when the pictures are taken in color, they are very beautiful color emissions coming out and changing according to the state of the health of the organism. They can do it with people, too. Is this just a photographic it's experience? It's a photographic technique. Just a technique. It's just a technique the way uh, x-rays are a photographic technique which will show the inside of the body. This shows an actual apparent aura of some kind, a bioplasma body that emanates. This is fingertips. And in a state of health, we apparently are emitting this from our fingertips. Now, they did a very fascinating thing with a man who's supposed to be able to heal with his hands. They took a very uh, magnified picture of actually it goes this way, of his thumb under an electron microscope. And this is his thumb in a state of rest. And you see these projections of what look like fire, almost like the sun's corona, coming off from his thumb tip when he's not working as a healer. Then when he does start to work as a healer, we get this fantastic discharge of this bioplasma body. And their suggestion, their belief is that perhaps when a person claims to be healing with his hands, the laying on of hands that was talked about in the Bible, that maybe there is some sort of influence that can be four, four lights, red, yellow, green, and blue. And depending on which button you press, if you think the blue one's going to light up, you press that button and it was wrong. Try it again for the green. I was wrong. Go ahead. No, keep on going. Now you've got a hit there. Now you've got another hit. Another hit. Keep on going. You're doing very well. Four hits in a row. That's very when young irrationalists talk about the superiority of living under the rule of the subconscious over the conscious. I'm reminded of a drunken driver because that's the perfect example of a life run without conscious control. And the smash which occurs to him physically occurs to these young people psychologically and sometimes physically. Mysticism, also. the supernatural, the occult are born out of fear. They are born out of psychological terror. Now, people have a great deal to be terrified of in the world today, it is true. But if ever they needed their rational faculties, it's now. Unfortunately, too often when people are frightened, their rational faculties are the first things they drop. And they reach 
for astrology, religion, some other kind of occultism, Satanism perhaps, imagining that they will thereby give themselves some kind of security, some kind of reassurance that the world isn't as they're perceiving it to be, or that they are on the side of some kind of higher powers that will give them some kind of protection. What can be done to turn the current trends toward a more rational direction? To begin with, I don't think it's going to last. I think we have made too much intellectual progress. I think it's a fad. I think it's so flagrantly a bankrupt dead end that I think people will get bored and tired of it in the not too distant future and it will collapse again into oblivion because it's so, it is so irrelevant to life and to our needs today. I think that what is needed is everyone who is competent to do so, philosophers, psychologists, ethicists, writers, talking about reason and about the urgent need of a return to reason and the application of reason to deal with man's problems. I don't see on. how sincerity could be involved in such a, uh, a silly so-called religion. He have completely sold himself to the devil. He have no part of God. He, everything he do over there is no part of God. Nothing God had anything to do with. It's something he created in his own mind. I think they're nuts. No, they're, they come in, they come in, you know, they're nice doctors and lawyers and very prominent people. And then they come in and they turn into completely different people. Well, it had occurred to me for many, many years that there was a uh, large grave area between psychiatry and religion that uh, was untapped. And no religion had ever been based on man's carnal needs or his fleshly pursuits. All religions are based on abstinence rather than indulgence. And all religions, therefore, have to be based, based on fear. Well, we don't feel that fear is necessary to base a religion on. <clears throat> the fact that religions for thousands of years have been uh, telling people what they should do and what they shouldn't do according to the basic whims of a person who might be running the show is very understandable. We're realists, we Satanists, but we also feel that a person has to be good to themselves before they can be good to other people. So we feel the greatest sin of all is self-deceit. This is a very selfish religion. We believe in greed, we believe in selfishness, we believe in all of the lustful thoughts that motivate man because this is man's natural uh, feeling. This is based on what man naturally would do. He's been in the neighborhood about 14 years and I always knew him as Tony and just a nice or a little more dramatic than most men in the neighborhood, perhaps, but uh, I certainly don't, I think he's very learned on the subject. He's done a lot of reading on uh, magic and all of that. Actually, I don't know what kind of man he is because uh, his appearance is very nice. He makes very good impressions. He has very soft voice and he talks so smooth, so, you know, so pleasant. And as soon as you meet him, you think he's a very, very nice man, you know. But uh, because uh, something going wrong, definitely, over there, I just had a feeling I can't trust him. A very undesirable type of a neighbor. The uh, property is not kept up, especially in the back. The overgrown backyard, weeds, the vent uh, drain pipes from the roofs are all shot. And the minute the winter hits in the wind, the slightest heavy wind blows most of his roof on my backyard. <laughs> I'm out there picking up shingles and pieces of tar paper. Before he used to have all his hair, just like uh, our curly head of hair. Um, now he shaved, you know, he um, shaved his head and um, wears the, um, the collar. And uh, he, he's, he, and being a Satanist minister, this too uh, is something that uh, sort of sets him apart. Uh, and I think um, rather original uh, of him to have uh, conceived this idea. Oh, according to this publicity man that I met, uh, this publicity man and Mr. LeVay came upon the idea uh, that um, with his owning a lion, the Satanist church uh, would be a, a wonderful offshoot. And since he 
did evidently believe in the devil, um, they hit upon the idea of the Satanist church. It, it, it's an attempt. It's an attempt at imitating orthodox religion and as an attempt to establish one by a form and ritual. Uh, he attempts to establish an actual religion. He has officiated, uh, at least in the newspapers and this picture of it, officiated as one death. And he has officiated at marriages and christenings. We feel guilt is a necessary thing, not necessary that it's uh, practiced at all times, but we're stuck with it. We have it in our collective unconscious. We have a certain amount of, uh, uh, of feeling of apprehension for things we've done because we're taught from childhood not to do certain things. Any attempt to sort of scrape the psyche clean is only going to make us much more, and certainly much more uh, uh, fraught with with frustrations and tensions. So what we've done is just reverse the procedure. Instead of trying to free ourselves, we've taken all these hang-ups, we've turned them into useful situations. If you're going to be a sinner, be the best sinner on the block. If you're going to do something that's uh, naughty, do it. And realize that you're doing something naughty and enjoy it. Being such strong believers as we are in the Mormon religion, of course there was, there was great conflict. Seems as if a belief in in a flesh, I mean, in in doing per se what you want to do while you're here upon this earth, not worrying about a life to come and and the fact that that God has has commanded us to do certain things. There are women. They are without clothes, naked, and uh, men are in kind of a uh, uh, black. Uh, black, uh, I don't know even the name of those clothes, you know, just a kind of high hat on a, on a, on a top. And they're all covered in black. And what I can see from my window sometimes, uh, it's a red light. And I'm in this red light, those uh, silhouettes, you know, like devils, I would say. And one silhouette, a big one, on the left side, I don't know, maybe it's him standing over the old crowd and preaching, probably. Most people um, who don't know anything about it, or him, um, I mean, I've met people who say, oh, you live next door to the man who believes in the devil, you know, and they get all excited and, and think there's, you know, some horrible goings on. Definitely, I think that Christian churches, they should be uh, maybe maybe active somehow, they, they should do something about it. Well, of course, uh, this is not the first time that uh, this sort of thing has um, been apparent in uh, the history of the Christian Church. Uh, from the very beginning, uh, in the fourth gospel, uh, this conflict of good and evil is brought forth very pointedly by a contrast between light and darkness. And the quotation from St. John's Gospel is, for men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds are evil. I would not want to dignify this uh, work out here uh, by calling it a church. Uh, it certainly doesn't have the ethical content that I think the Christian church has. And uh, we uh, certainly should keep, to keep our ethics high. And I think that this sort of thing that goes on here is anything but that. Myself, I have naturally many of the same problems, the trials and tribulations of any regular minister of any other church. The only thing that really uh, presents a difference is the fact that I cannot uh, perhaps be sanctimonious about things, but I can do anything that I want to. I can pursue any kind of lustful desires that I might feel. I can. Uh, engage in any activities that are so-called sinful activities and not really worry about any ecumenical councils making it right for me to do these things. Okay, now for me to stand up and say, this is wrong, you shouldn't be there, everything you're doing is morally wrong and legally wrong, then I'm denying him his right. I'm denying him his right to say that he believes 
in the satanic church that, that he stands up for what he believes in. You know, and this is his own prerogative. I mean, if he wants to do it, let him do it. And I think more power to him that he has you know, the courage to stand up to quite a few bigoted people. And they think of it as an evil kind of philosophy until I begin to discuss the philosophy of Satanism with them in the sta from the standpoint of view of being opposed to hypocrisy. Well, that's the conception um, that most people have is that it is, uh, they're uh, really evil. Yeah. The, uh, the conce concept that the Christian church has exactly. of Satan. Exactly. Just the opposite of the Christian philosophy is, uh, as uh, most people would think of it. Uh, the Christian philosophy would put forth uh, a great love theme and we would be the opposite. We would just hate everyone. It's like saying that uh, you have to only hate to be a Satanist. You cannot love. It's like saying that people that aren't Satanists only love and can't practice hate. Practice hate. Therefore, Satanists must practice hate. But that's like saying that just because somebody uh, uh, drinks coffee, they can never drink tea. And people like to believe that, though, because they always talk very much about a curse that's been conjured successfully. It even makes the newspapers but any kind of a blessing that will save someone or pull somebody through a financial yeah. bind, nobody ever talks about that. And it shows that we are right in our judgment as far as human nature and what it represents. Sexual freedom is something we feel is very important. It's a necessary requisite of the satanic church. It isn't the most important thing, but certainly it's an elective. We feel a person should be free to indulge in all of the so-called fetishes, all of the so-called uh, uh, admirations that they would so desire, as long as they don't hurt anyone that doesn't deserve or wish to be hurt. I think uh, it should be brought out that we not only condone but we encourage all types of what would be called sexual perversities and deviations because we feel that in a few short years it will be established that everyone is a sexual deviant, pervert, fetishist or something or other and that the person that isn't is the exception rather than the rule. So We'll be on the ground floor. We feel that uh, uh, too much emphasis has been placed on so-called sexual freedom in quotes, meaning everybody take their clothes off and, yeah. and, and be reduced. You ring a bell and you say, strip, and, and then you know. A daisy chain and your anchor man. <laughs> and this is really working at sexual freedom, we feel. That uh, to really have sexual freedom, you should take what are already your hang-ups, as they call them, and have fun with them. Mm -hmm. Why are you We're talking about that? sexual freedom? Let's put it this way. There has been very few people that are against it, whether they belong to the satanic well, church or not. Well, they just don't so want to admit it. They won't admit it. So yeah, that's right. Just as much and well, it's another one of those IOUs. And this is practiced very freely yeah. yeah. you know. by other groups other than there. So here it's an individualist. Uh, it's individual desire. If you want to do this sort of thing, well, that's up to you. If you don't want to do this thing, you're not required to do this you know, in this church. Even uh, church you're not looked down upon if you don't want to participate in this sort of thing, nor are you looked down upon if you do. I Whatever you hang up, it's your own business. So we have homosexuals in the group. Yeah. But, they're accepted. That's but they're, the they're accepted. But they're accepted. They're accepted and no one makes any fun of them. And There's no tolerance, in other words, of homosexuals. We don't feel as though we have to tolerate no. them. No. We just simply accept them just as much as we would accept ourselves or the person next to us that would think exactly the way we would sexually. The attitude is, who cares? Well, I think well, this, is, this is Satanism, yeah. actually. Yeah. The, the acceptance without tolerance, as, as Anton said, is just a natural acceptance of people as they really are. And when you come right down to the essence of Satanism, isn't this really what Satanism is? It's the only normal it, it, we're not right. patronizing it's, That's for right. Them, it's, an, it's not tolerance. Actually, we're it is, normal. It's knowledge and acceptance of people as they really are. It's reality. It's practicality. I don't really find it that logical. I find it for someone who wants to enjoy life while they're here, but not worry about what's actually in the afterlife. We believe in a pre-existence. We ask the questions, where did we come from, why are we here, and where are we going? We know we had a pre-existence, we're on the earth to be tried and to gain a mortal body. And after we die, we go to a spirit world, spirit world and then we're judged and sent to one of the three kingdoms, celestial, terrestrial, or telestial. That's how we feel, and it's stated in the Bible. And we do believe very firmly and strictly in the Bible. This is our basic belief. We believe that there is a God, that He had a Son, Jesus Christ. He was the first. And then Satan was the one that was cast out because of His selfishness. 
I guess the two most popular reasons that people join the church is because either they're just disgusted or they're just fed up with the sanctimonious pussyfooting around that other religions have given them and they're just tired of uh, saying one thing and practicing another and they'd like to at least get together with other people and after all man is a social animal and uh, no different than any other animal except he's probably the most vicious of all animals and uh, he wants to get together with other people that feel the same way he does and why not belong to a religion or to a group of people that at least uh, believe in the same philosophy I met Adam and a party and there was an immediate sympathy between us. So we exchanged cards and talked to each other with telephone. And uh, Anton said, I know you're a witch and you must come to our Valpurgis night, which is now about three or four years ago, isn't it, Diane? And uh, from then on, I became more and more interested, of course, I was interested in witchcraft to begin with, and that is connected with Satan, as we all know. It wasn't actually that I was interested in Satanism. It was that I was interested in witchcraft. And I always had been, and I happened to read an advertisement for Witch's Charm School with lectures by Anton LaVey. And I wanted very badly to go and finally I called and asked what time it started I came so I learned about love potions and charms and um, but mostly I guess is the charm school was how to attract man do you think it's worked for you? well I, I think it's worked But I'm not after getting a particular man. <laughs> There's a difference, you know? I mean, I'm not out to get one for keeps, you know? You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. I look at it this way. She might be somebody's daughter or somebody's sister, and I would want somebody to take my sister out and to use her before she was married because this is something we teach in our church, and I think that she should really wait for her husband. And by taking advantage of a girl, I would be doing something to someone's sister or someone's daughter that they wouldn't care to have done. And she will lose her virtue, but often regret it afterwards. And this is what we try and fight against, the sorrow that is caused by uh, something right at the moment. What, what do you derive personally from the church? A great deal of pleasure. I always get a lift when I come here. I suppose like other people do when they go to church, which... I haven't done for many years now. I got a little confused about all the different denominations and I couldn't take it anymore. So I, everybody thought they were the only ones and I just couldn't go along with it. And I retired into nature and uh, that's how I live today. And I feel that I'm usually very serene and quite happy this way. Uh, basically, I think I've always been a witch. Ever since I was a child, I've known that this is what I've always wanted to be. And to find people that believe the same way as I do, well, it's just great. What, what do you get out of saying this? Um, for one thing, it gives you great self-confidence. You know you can do things anything really anything that you want you can do you can accomplish either through your own ability or through magic one of the two i was raised to believe in god so naturally still i believe there is a god i don't believe that he does all the things that you're taught in sunday school and to believe that he does but i do believe there is one I don't think that God is dead. I think that we have a power, or maybe many powers. And it certainly looks to me the way the world is going today, that what people think is the evil power. Now, I don't connect that with Satan altogether. But 
That is the prevailing power today. It has become an eccentricity to be honest, for instance. And uh, all of the hypocrisy that we have to not accept, because I don't, I won't have any of that, but that is going on. It revolts me. And I don't like bigotry. So in some ways I'm bigoted too, because I'm intolerant of intolerance in any form or shape. Do you, do you have any children? No. What if you I only have dogs. <laughs> <laughs> I worked out my mother complex on the dogs. If, if you had children today, how would you raise them in Satanism and how would you raise them? I would raise them to be themselves. I would raise them with certain ethical principles which I feel are necessary. It's happier to be that way. I cannot tell you whether I would raise them in Satanism. I don't think I would raise them as Christians. I do not today consider myself a Christian anymore. I uh, heard that at one time he was planning on um, setting up sort of a house of whips type of thing. Um, similar to something they had back east. There was this uh, German gal or something like a the Countess of the Whips in New Jersey or something. And I understand that she was here in San Francisco and that he was planning to do something along this line with whips and masochism and status and all that stuff. And this did disturb me. But uh, I understand that this did not pan out. Some of these rituals consist of recreations of old ceremonies that have been practiced for centuries. We recreate the ceremonies of the Knights Templars, a noble group of gentlemen who, because of social pressures, made it very obvious that they were the standard bearers of Christianity. We feel that in the light of what society has shown us in the last year or two, we have pretty much uh, exemplify what the Knights Templars were doing, except we, of course, climate-wise, don't have to worry about calling ourselves Christians. We call ourselves Satanists. We recreate many of these ceremonies. We also recreate many of the ceremonies of the West Indian Voodoo religion. And uh, we also will utilize Norse ritual, the casting of the runes, calling upon of Wotan, and Thor, and Loki, and all of the gods and demigods of the northern regions. Carl, have you, have you ever seen any of the services? No, they don't let me go. It's unfit for my eyes. It's <laughs> they they never don't corrupt my mind. You're never back from me. carousel or yeah, film or auditorium <laughs> in time enough for the session. But whenever I am, so that you get upstairs, you get upstairs. Because then when other kids you know, yelling at their parents, you know, saying, well, she can be there, why can't I be there? And so, I can understand it, so I don't feel too bad about it. Well, now, I can imagine what it is on anyway. See, he doesn't want her to get mixed in that. But he's leading other people the wrong way, you know, the ones that follow him, you know. We feel that the, uh, the so-called carnal side of man, or the carnal nature of man, is the most important. We feel the soul is just a pittance. It's something that's sort of wrung out. Like if you squeeze an orange, you get a few drops of juice out of it. And certainly this can be the essence. But this doesn't mean that the orange is any less important simply because the juice comes out of it. We feel that the body of man, the carnal symbolism of man, is by far the most important. We feel true transcendentalism is to rise above the inventions, the puerile inventions of man for his own uh, oh, masochistic needs perhaps in the way of spiritual or soul guidance and recognize his baser instincts, his carnal existence as the end or byproduct and as the epitome, the height of all great creation. In other words, this is the opposite. 
It's the very opposite, the very adverse of all other religions. And it's high time a religion was born that recognized the fleshly existence of man. But we lead a normal, abnormal life. In other words, we eat regular meals and sleep semi-regular hours, but uh, life is much more interesting, I think, than for most people. And naturally, we are involved in topics that are abnormal. I don't know, I guess they take great delight in paralleling us to like the Adams family or something. This is Mr. LeVay's second wife, and I've, and um, he acquired the, um, the pet lion, I believe, uh, before she married him. And I thought that it was rather interesting. I mean, I, I could see that if, if you were married to a man already and he owned a, a lion, you know, you just take it as one of those things. But I thought it would, uh, took a special type of uh, young lady to uh, marry a man with a pet lion. It's really kind of strange because like she's old enough to be my sister and yet she can boss me around and I have to do it. It's kind of nice though having a mother, you know. Same age pretty much because she understands. I suppose I'm as happy here as I would be any place else. I've never been any place else. Don't know. I mean, our house, we don't live in a little Santa Rosa suburban home or anything, you know. Well, inside the house, it's normal. Except for, like, my father, he isn't around very much because he's always real busy. My parents are busier than most parents, I think. And so we sort of have to take care of ourselves more. I think it's easier raising a family with uh, a moral code that is flexible. I think that um, that virtues should not be based on uh, this standard, hackneyed, uh, trite moral code that we've been forced to live by. I think that um, virtues should be things like, you know, kindness and courtesy and understanding and uh, do unto others as they do unto you. If you do unto others as you would have them do unto you, that's fine. But if they just keep doing unto you badly in return, then, you know, it's ridiculous to treat them with any kind of consideration. But I think that you just give uh, children uh, sort of the laws of the jungle to live by. But I think we're maybe more normal than normal people because once we close the door to our house uh, it's our castle and, and we do anything we want to inside and we don't concern ourselves with what other people think um, and we just get anything out of our system that uh, might serve to, uh, if it were repressed, uh, be harmful to us. The only discord that came was when he had the lion. Um, about about a year ago, well no, about three or four years ago, he acquired a baby lion. And initially, um, everyone thought, uh, gee, how cute, or, you know, how different, because he was only about the size of a large cat uh, initially. But then he, he got to be three years old and about, I'm not sure, about 500 pounds of lion, and, and that's quite different uh, than having a, a little kitty cat for a neighbor. And uh, he, uh, the, the lion, being a nocturnal animal, would uh, sleep during the daytime, and then at night he would um, roar. And I mean, uh, you'd get up in the middle of the night, and you, you would think that uh, you were near Mount Kilimanjaro or something. I don't know. They say he makes too much noise. Uh, I never really hear him. Oh, I heard him... He does make a little noise. I heard him one time when I was walking past, but I don't think... I don't really think he was that noisy or something like that. I'm hard of hearing, and the lion didn't bother me at all. But it bothered the neighbors to such an extent that they were positive it must bother me, and they were ringing me up to do something about it. Here in San Francisco, there's a statute uh, preventing ownership of uh, horses, rabbits, I believe, um, and other domesticated animals that you usually find on the farm. However, naturally, uh, our city fathers had not anticipated that anyone would uh, keep a lion, so there was nothing on the books 
against keeping a lion, and Mr. LeVay was entirely within his rights. But when he interfered with the entire neighborhood, it became our business. And that's when we had him arrested, and he got fined $50 and three months in jail, uh, suspended, and a year's probation. He lived with us for about three years, and he was always very rough, and, and uh, of course we had to take a great deal of precautions with the children, because just playing, he could kill one of them, so naturally we didn't let him in the room uh, with the children, although he did sleep in our bedroom at night. But he was so sweet and so well trained that he used to wrap his mouth around Anton's leg and just sort of hold it for security. And if he started to bear down a little too hard, Anton would just say, no bite, Togar, and Togar would release it. I was in love with the children. I never got tired of watching him. He had the most beautiful head, the most beautiful eyes. And one night I wanted to pet him, and I did pet him. But he wanted to play with me, so he grabbed my wrist. And my dogs do that quite often, and I didn't think about it until his fangs were going down into my wrist. <laughs> and then I just stood there like I was petrified, and Diane said, He's biting you, isn't he? And I said, yes, he is. <laughs> but I didn't know what to do. If I had known it, I would just have said, no, no. You know, I knew that if I tried to take my hand back again, I probably wouldn't have had a hand left. <laughs> so I can brag about being one of the few people who's been bitten by an eye, which I'm very proud of. <laughs> oh, well, I can remember when he had the satanic wedding, the kids were sneaking up in the house and pulling open the, the curtains to see if there really was a nude girl on the altar. And uh, when the police came to break the crowd up, the little kids ran up to him and said, uh, hey, mister, there's a nude lady on the altar. And of course, you know, the policeman, oh, yeah, sure, right. Walked into the house. Not only did they see the lion, but they saw the nude lady. And you've never seen so many men with such a shock expression on their face in your life. I heard something uh, else. But I, I don't know uh, too much. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. no uh, really. Uh, but, um, no, please, please. Uh, <laughs> no, really. Uh, no, it's okay. It's okay. Don't, don't, don't worry. Yeah, just what else did you hear? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you if you turn out the camera first, and I'll tell you. <laughs> Well, you remember when I told you that I met Mr. Weber? Well, Mr. Weber, uh, who I, Ms. and I, like, I don't know too much about, um, about these things, but Mr. Weber told me that, um, and I'm pretty sure it was Mr. Weber, uh, that told me that, um, when they had the lion, and I believe he's a male lion, uh, that he took place, uh, took part in some of their sexual activities, and I, I didn't quite, uh, figure out how it worked or anything, but, uh, <laughs> this is something that I did here. I don't know, well, when the lion uh, got a loose over there, he did, uh, tear the house up, you know, and they said it was due to sex, that he was, uh, wanted to mate, and he went to the bedroom where his wife was, which his wife do have a scar on her left shoulder, where the lion tacked her. I saw that in court myself. Because she was sitting next to me when she pulled her blouse down, you could see where the line had struck on the shoulder. So now he might would train him up to that, you know. He's the baby. He had him from a club, so he could have had to train him on that. He um, was babysitting uh, this jaguar for a friend, and he had the jaguar downstairs. And the lion evidently uh, smelled the jaguar down below, became jealous and enraged and went on a rampage, started tearing up all the pipes on the porch. And um, <laughs> they couldn't call a plumber very well because not very many plumbers are going to go in. So anyway, and then uh, Mr. LeVay brought the lion inside and he did quite a bit of damage, according to the papers, uh, to Mr. LeVay's own personal effects. Um, you know, drapes and um, a leather coat I read in the paper and a few other things. And still Mr. LeVay didn't uh, donate the uh, lion to the zoo, uh, but then on the following day, he did some more damage. 
it did uh, damage two days in a row. And then at this time, uh, he did decide to donate the animal to the zoo. And uh, at that time, he um, bit, I think, a uh, man from the SPCA and um, one of the policemen, too, was nipped, I think, too. It was really very sad that we had to take him to the zoo. Um, we didn't want to, naturally, and never would have had, would have, unless we had really been forced to do it. We put a generalized curse on all those who helped to get rid of Togar, and they've either, a curse will do one of two things. It will either uh, destroy or rehabilitate, and that's exactly what's happened. We perform human sacrifices by proxy, you might say, the destruction of human beings who would, let's say, create an antagonistic situation towards us in the form of curses and hexes, not in actual blood rituals because certainly the destruction of a human being physically is illegal, but we feel that the sacrifice should be a deserving one. We don't chop up babies or cut the heads off of cats or chickens or goats. We feel that this is another example of the sanctimonious hypocrisy of those who call themselves witches, warlocks, white magicians, who have practiced these things for centuries. Well, his one neighbor, when we was in court, that he testified that he had put a spell on his little girl. He said that uh, his little girl was sick and it was due to Mr. Lovell was uh, had a spell on him. What all these works? There's no doubt in my mind that it's not going to work. I mean, we just say, make something happen, and it happens. They say he charged from 200 to 300 dollars for this. But if it's good luck, he put it on you, and if it's spell, if he get mad, he can put it, turn it into a spell. They claim to um, cause the cliff house, which was being wrecked, to uh, burn up. But that is after the event. No, I'm not afraid that he's put any hex on me. I've put one on him, though. Yeah. And my hex on him is that I hope he begins to believe himself. If he does, sooner or later he'll be pinned up. Uh, well, um, I don't know too much about it, but uh, I have seen uh, boa constrictors. Uh, in fact, I, I'm really um, a little leery of... Uh, snakes, but I think I touched one at a, at a junior museum once, and uh, there were, uh, in fact, I thought it was kind of, they called this particular one uh, Julia Squeezer, and, um, you know, they, uh, they're really kind of uh, harmless, <laughs> so I mean, uh, if, you know, if, if she wants a bowl constrictor around her, I mean, that's all right. The paintings are a collection of, most of them are my own. And uh, many of them were given to me as gifts by other people who thought that uh, they were not good enough for their own houses, or at least to frighten their neighbors or something. So they passed them on to me. I've got a lot of rejects, white elephants of other people. And uh, so naturally I'm very appreciative because most of the things that other people wouldn't have in their homes are the things that I seem to wind up with in mine. Most of the uh, objects of art in the paintings are gifts or things that have been donated along the line, but the paintings that I've done are inspired pretty much through either article stories that I've read, fascinating dreams that I've had, nightmare visions, and uh, my own ideas for plots for perhaps situations and events. So you might say they do have stories, they're not just purely abstract. I would say these things like the skulls, the tombstones, the coffins, any of these various objects of art are memento mores, are just symbols of death. These uh, do not imply in any way that we're the least bit eager to die or have any sort of Freudian death wish. On the contrary, these are constant reminders that death is around the corner and death doesn't present a better uh, than what we have now world. Death presents a negation of many of the pleasures of the flesh, and certainly most of them. And uh, so we feel that the more things that can remind us of this, the more inspired we are to live each day to its fullest. But as far as the torture implements go, <coughs> these things we must remember at one time were not simply torture implements, they were evangelical persuaders. And most of these things are from the Inquisition, and uh, this type of uh, device 
was known as a holy water sprinkler at one time, and uh, also called the morning star. And so uh, these things represent man's inhumanity to man, but also represent something to the Satanist much more important than that, that right is based on might, and the victor, whether they're right or whether they're wrong idealistically, is always considered right. The tombstone was a gift from a mortician, a man in the mortuary profession, and uh, it's quite old. It serves as a coffee table. The dental chair and barber chair combination was also a gift, of course, used during the period when dentists and barbers were pretty much one and the same. The reproduction of the outer lid of the sarcophagus of King Tut was uh, given to me. It was made by a member of the congregation and given to me for the purposes of uh, enhancing rituals that would be of an Egyptian nature or origin. The altar is a living slab of flesh in the personification or in the person of a nude young woman. The altar stone or the mantle which holds the altar was made from cobblestones from the San Francisco streets that were broken up in the 1906 earthquake. Little did it, I'm sure, become aware to the stonemason that it would be used for the purposes that it is today. Probably some of the clergy are jealous of him. Uh, there was the memorable incident of the redhead on the altar, sans clothing and so forth. Uh, he was not the first one to think of this. A clergyman in uh, New York in Greenwich Village had a blonde on the altar, and uh, there remains for some enterprising soul to uh, think of a brunette. What's it feel like when you're up on the altar during ceremony? Oh, during a ritual? Well, the power starts building up. I guess the power sounds like a real corny word, but it's a, an adrenaline energy that starts building up in you. Don't ask me just why. I suppose it's a, you should call, you could call it a satanic ecstasy. And you feel like you're the universe, not just part of it, you feel like you're the whole thing. And sometimes your body just feels like it, it's just going to, you know, fly apart. Sometimes I just get so charged up that I don't think they can make a battery comparable. And, well, I don't know, it's completely exhilarating. I don't know whether people on pot or LSD feel this way or not. If they don't, I'm sorry for them. How old are you, Oh, really now? <laughs> Well, let's say, uh, would you believe 53? <laughs> How old do you feel? Uh, at the moment? Oh, I guess about 18. What would your parents say about that? If I got up in the altar? Yeah. I'd think they would die, but I'd love to do it. <laughs> Isn't that terrible? That is fantastic. I'm glad that's not on TV. <laughs> I think if there was a need for it, I mean, I, I'm not the type. I don't look like the type for a, a nude altar. I mean, usually they're new authors, they're usually, like they like to have them light-haired and voluptuous and big and fat. And I mean, that just isn't me. My girlfriend is built. I mean, she has a, an unbelievable figure. In fact, she does not look good in clothes. She's a little bit too well endowed. And uh, when the, one of the priests that he has, keeps offering her, you know, a job at the altar. And every time she gets a new job, we go down to this, um, every time she gets a little loaded, she keeps saying, you know, I want to do it. Let me do it. <laughs> I think every home should have its own altar. <laughs> really? Everyone needs a satanic altar. Well, I think my altar days are over. <laughs> Well, I had a man come to me the other day, and he said that it was just terrible. That when he joined the Satanic Church, he was masturbating just about every day. And now he's masturbating two and sometimes three times a day. And he's very happy, much happier than he's ever been before. Last week, too, on top of it. I think masturbation has been really a tabooed subject of all time, and I think we should mention it a little. Well, now, what do you think? Yeah. Well, I've uh, taught my son to masturbate. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Night games, huh? 
the hollow well. Well, he was yeah, the uh, way. Well, uh, mostly because he had uh, was getting pimples, and, and <laughs> I first uh, we started talking about it, and I told him why he was having pimples and this type of thing. Well, he, at first he didn't go along with the idea. He insisted that I buy him these patent things, you know, that you rub on your face, and they weren't doing any good. And I told him if he continued to pop the pimples, that's what he called the pop. <laughs> <laughs> then he'd end up with acne scars, and the girls wouldn't like him. <laughs> And, uh, and so I refused absolutely to buy him these um, uh, concoctions he wanted to put on his face. And I told him that um, if he didn't start masturbating and doing it regularly, he was just going to have to put up with the pimples. And he didn't say anything about it. He didn't say yes or no, but I, the pimples are gone. <laughs> <laughs> this is quite a switch because in my day, this is a thing that caused pimples. <laughs> I mean, nothing to do with uh, your day. I guess things change, you know. And then, yeah, they, and then you, there you was the, the night that Lenore brought her son to uh, a party, yeah. which was sort of uh, open to, you know, family uh, of the church. And she, he was being kind of uh, a bad boy or something. I don't know what he was doing, being sassy or irritable or something. And she said, What's the matter, Pericles? Haven't you masturbated today? <laughs> <laughs> Well, the magical rituals that are performed by so-called white magicians and uh, have been performed for centuries in magical circles where they chop the heads off chickens or sacrifice goats and all this sort of thing. This is considered the most secret of secret sacrifices, the most vile of the most sacrifices, that of the blood sacrifice. The blood sacrifice is really just a, a lesser version of a much eviler sacrifice, which in some of the old grimoires on witchcraft and ceremonial magic are hinted at only enough so that you know, reading very thoroughly, that the greatest of all secret sacrifices during a ceremonial ritual is, of course, the spilling of the seed on the ground. And so, rather than just masturbate in the eyes of their Jehovah, these so-called magicians would, would kill an innocent animal just for its blood throw agony to be put out into the atmosphere, which to me is one of the true blasphemies, which, of course, is white magic, too. Doesn't uh, the Holy Rollers uh, uh, operate more or less on the masturbation principle, even though they won't admit to this? I, I went to two or three of these things, and I noticed that the women and the men both were getting sexually excited, and it looked like they were having an orgasm. So. Yeah. You mean they were rolling over the floor and they were becoming really very excited. excited. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Sure. this yeah. happens in a lot of ecstatic kinds. I got the impression that said they were having an argument. Well, well, like Crowley used, used to do that. Would that be masturbation, though? He would, he oh, would, he would in a ritual uh, <laughs> masturbate. They don't call it that. Uh, that's Subudu. Uh, same thing. Huh? That's Subudu. Well, a lot of women can not masturbate without using their hands. You know? <laughs> Why would I know? I've because been knowing you know about boys a long well, time. <laughs> I, know. I, I, know. I, I, use, I use boys. <laughs> when did you find boys? They used to put the boys in straight jobs. What age did you find out there were boys? I know about ten. Did you ever read this accounting of the old days when they had the sweatshops and the women would all work these hands? These uh, foot travel machine every so often. Wow! Uh, yeah, and give out with a scream and turn red. And wham, she got it right then and there. I mean, really? This, yes, really. This is really good. Really 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 imagine getting your kicks in a sweatshop. <laughs> <laughs> well, you didn't get paid money, you had to get some thrill out. The diamond industry was founded on that time. Masturbating by singer. I'm in league with the devil as much as any mortal can possibly be. I would say I'm in league with the uh, dark side of nature. I don't think he's ever really been down there anyway, because according to all religionists, he walks the earth as a man, and he's supposed to take charge of carnal or mundane pursuits. Satan was the son of Christ, a son of God. He was the uh, one who uh, wanted to come to the earth and uh, take upon himself the pride and the things that he would gain here upon the earth and not give the honor to his father. And Satan uh, truly is a devil. Uh, he has power over us if we let him, if we let down our guard, as I've said. But if we have faith in our Father in heaven and we pray to him often, we honor his son, Jesus Christ, we'll be able to overcome this factor.
devil. Maybe he is. The thing he is doing is devilish, definitely, because it is against, against the God. The idea of the devil and of Satan as an individual which he can communicate with is a fantasy in his own head or an imagination of his own. The, um, the hell that is supposed to be uh, controlled by the devil is what the individual makes for himself. If he is not in league with the devil, then his entire church, his entire religion is a farce. And uh, it, then, it, then it would be a racket, then it would be a religion. What do you think it is? I hope it's a religion. I hope that because of all it, the, the services he has, the, the speeches that he makes, and the people that he does convince that this is a, a true religion, I hope he's not deceiving them. I hope that he really believes. I'd be more inclined to think that this is just a means of personal aggrandizement and enhancement. He could work as anybody else, you know. We are working people who make our living a decent way, you know. But probably it was too much. So he tried to get the uh, easiest way. So he sits home, he doesn't do anything, you know. He has all kind of things in his house, secret passages and all kind of... Uh, light, you know, it, 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 it makes effects, you know, it affects people. I uh, have no doubt that he is uh, out purely for publicity. One of the most objectionable things to me is when a person asks, well, what do you have to collect money for? What do you have to charge for this religion for? Why don't you just have a free will thing or it doesn't cost to go with this religion? And they accuse me of just being a money-making racketeer, a con man of some sort. When every other religion on the face of the earth hasn't seen to object to, to uh, taking money from their parishioners, they've built large cathedrals in the midst of people living in squalor. They've constantly garnished people's wages, uh, in a sense, by having so many, uh, so much percentage subscribe to churches. And yet, no one has ever criticized this that is uh, in the position usually to criticize me for conducting a continence game of any kind. I feel the money spent would be poured into the satanic church, and I say poured into it, if possible, to be used for, or would be used for, much more worthwhile purposes than the building of edifices and cathedrals where the people who live in squalor, in many cases around them, can simply go into the church, beat their chests, and say, I am not worthy. At least when you give the devil his due, he smiles upon you for at least expecting a little payment in return. No, he's not a charlatan. He really uh, believes in it and uh, what he does, he, he practices what he preaches. And uh, what he preaches is really is living and eating good and loving good, drinking good, just living good. Much you can. It seems that most religions now are buying oats for a dead horse. We feel that uh, all religions are coming around to Satanism. We're in the uh, very throes of a new satanic age. The evidence is all around us. All we have to do is look at it. There is a new title for Christians called Christian Atheists. And uh, of course many movements such as the Unitarian Church have existed for a while in what would amount to a form of atheism in evening clothes. And we feel that there is no reason why these people shouldn't just flip the coin completely over and simply call themselves what religion has called them for many, many years. Call them devil worshippers or disciples of evil or Satanists. Of course, it's very hard for a person to hang an uncomplimentary label on themselves. And for this reason, for many years, there will be people practicing Satanism as good Christians or other religions. And uh, they will in in instinctively pursue the very same things that we are, as they always have. Satan is simply a word that means the adversary, or the opposition, or the accuser. It doesn't necessarily mean evil or brutality or cruelty. 
It simply means the dissenter. Do you think the Satanic Church is a threat to Christianity? <clears throat> uh, do I think it's a threat? Well, 6,000 people against millions is a small threat. It's just like communism creeping up. But I think the Satanic Church has its own views, and I think that each person should have the opportunity to express their views, freedom of speech. And if people have these beliefs, it's up to them. And if they really do believe these things, it's really up to them. But would you like to, you know, urge them to read the Bible and to pray about these things before they enter into these things? And remember, just as Mr. Uh, Lavelle said, he said that they don't want people to join the church because of uh, carnal reasons, that they want them to join because they do believe in the religion. And I think that a lot of the people are going to join for carnal reasons. And that uh, this is a bad part of it. You, you find this morally wrong then? Yes, I do. He was tremendously busy during Halloween.